Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about sociological theories. And in all of my classes, I like to start out the same way and ask the question, what class are we in? And everyone says sociology. And then I say, what is sociology? And you guys say the study of society. And then I say, what's a society? And you say a group of people with something in common or a common bond. And then what's the purpose of the theories to be able to explain society? So again, what's the sociological perspective? Is this way of looking at the world through a sociological lens. And when we think about sociological theories, really we're looking at paradigms, these lenses by which we can view society. And again, there are multiple perspectives in how to view society. Therefore, we often need tons of theories. For the purpose of this lecture, we're just going to focus on the big three, functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism. But there are theories upon theories that cross fields. You have biosociology, for example, the blending of biology and sociology, social psychology or the psychology of social behavior, uh, the blending of sociology and psychology, the biopsychosocial approach. You have role theory. You have all these other theories. I might uh, hint at <clears throat> feminism and queer theory just a little bit when we talk about conflict theory. But again, there are theories upon theories, just all these different unique ways of being able to look at society. And uh, But the big ones we're going to talk about again are functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionism today. <clears throat> okay, so what is the sociological imagination? This allows us to understand the relationship between individual forces and larger social forces. Again, this is what was often referred to as the intersection of biography and history when you go back and study the old sociological thinking. But again, why do we you know, even have sociology in the first place? Because it teaches us you know, how does the social context structure us? How does it affect our personality? How does it affect our behavior? And so the theories just kind of give us this reference point from which to view how society structures our behavior, for example. And then it kind of accounts for why we do things the way we do things and how we ended up where we are and how the time we live in, for example, or the culture we live in, for example, or our race or our biological sex, all of which create divergent experiences. But again, so much of this is shaped by the social context, because again, culture is a social phenomena, for example. Um, but again, how does race, class, gender, religion, economics, politics, how do they all structure your life? And again, we can use these theories to better understand these um, ideas. So again, we have some micro sociological theories that we're going to talk about today, like symbolic interactionism. Again, that's the looking at the small groups that make up the whole, for example. And there's macro sociology, studying the big groups. I often think of micro sociology as kind of starting from the small and going to the big. And then macro sociology is going from the big to the small. And, you know, functionalists and conflict theory kind of start from the big to the small. And then things like symbolic interactionism, where we're talking about how the world is socially constructed, again, starts out with individuals interacting to make up the groups. And so it's recognized over time, you know, that blending of sociology and psychology, whereas psychology was always the individual and sociology has always been groups of people. But again, groups are made up of individuals and group structure individuals. And so again, that interplay between psychological and sociological forces, or the individual and the social forces is an interesting approach. And so we're going to talk about three theories to apply that. So again, the goal of the sociological theories is to explain how society works. That's the easiest way I can say it. And we're talking about groups of people as we're talking about society, we're talking about groups of people, the social context that they create, how they interact, how they behave, and the institutions that they construct. Theories are just trying to explain the social world. And again, there's not always just one answer that works. Sometimes we need multiple theories. So again, the big macro ones we're talking about today, functionalism and conflict theory, and then the micro theories like symbolic interactionism. Again, a paradigm is a set of assumptions, theories, and perspectives that make up a way of understanding social reality. And each of the theories that we'll talk about today are essentially paradigms, ways of viewing the social world. We can also combine these theories to create a paradigm to explain how society works. Again, there's aspects of functionalism and conflict theory and symbolic interactionism that all go together. 
again, it's individuals who created things like the economy and the economy exists for a reason, functionalism, but again, it also creates conflict. And so again, that's the blending of all three theories right there. We'll get deeper into it. All right. So the first big one is structural functionalism. The idea of functionalism is that society is a unified whole that functions because of the contributions of its separate structures or institutions. What this means is, is that all of the institutions in society interact to structure our daily life. And arguably, each institution was created for a purpose. These institutions include the education system. Why do we create it? To socialize people and to credentialize and enable meritocratic rising up the social class ladders that the best and the brightest can rise up. Um, we also have the economy. Why was that created? You know, to exchange goods and services, a religion that fulfills all kinds of supportive things, or the family. What function does a family serve? And so when we're talking about functionalism, we're always going to ask, what's the function or what's the purpose of the institution? Why did we create it itself? And again, these institutions that include the healthcare system also, military and government and the media and other institutions that aren't necessarily included in old school structural functionalism. But again, we are the ones who came up with racial categories and gender roles. These serve a purpose. That's the question. Uh, Emile Durkheim is the main figure for functionalist theory. And again, you got to ask, why does society exist in the first place? And so Durkheim was trying to figure that out. And he basically says that social bonds exist in all society, but different societies create different bonds. And society itself is heather held together by social bonds. What exactly does that mean? But again, it's that connection to groups of people that is part of being human, arguably. Do we work in groups biologically? Is that built into our DNA? And if so, is the society just a byproduct of us creating a social world in which we can all get along and all these important roles that need filled can be filled, for example? Do we need connections to each other? Is that why we form groups Again, do we need those social bonds? And the answer is yes, it's in our DNA. But again, our biology doesn't necessarily create social worlds like we have today that comes through us building society to serve a purpose, to serve a function, and whether or not that is to unite us, to hold us together, or to fulfill a set of social roles, or just to organize our behavior. All of these are legit under functionalism. Oh, yeah, uh, just to finish out, the idea is, why do we have things like rules and institutions in the first place? And again, what would happen if we didn't have a predictable society? So again, did we create society in such a way that it's predictable and stable so that it removes these unintended consequences, for example? I mean, I like to think about it like street light, right? Like what happens if we don't have street lights? Do people just drive all over and go crazy? What happens if people just don't follow the rules and there aren't like police to enforce the use of street lights? You know, would there be more car accidents, for example? So again, there's a reason that we've created roads and street lights to be able to manage the traffic so that it can reduce the chaos and create a predictable and orderly society. So again, how was society bonded together? Uh, Durkheim gets into solidarity, the idea of the degree of integration within a society. Again, how connected are we to each other or the extent to which individuals feel connected to other members of their group? There's mechanical solidarity when social bonds present in pre-modern times. Again, think about tribes. And then you have organic solidarity like we do today. And again, are our attachments to people different than they used to be back in the day? And I like to think about it like this, like in modern times, you know, you might like back in the day, you might have relied on like a whole tribe to get along. But think about how many people you rely on today to survive. Like how many people does it take just to have the electricity in your house work? Or how many plumbers do you need to keep the water working or police to manage society? Or what would happen if one nuclear bomb went off? You know what I mean? And so, again, we might not have the mechanical solidarity like we once did in the small town kind of feel or the small tribe, you know, as we become more urban over time. But again, how many people we depend on is actually increased. But again, I like to think about mechanical as kind of like tribal times or small town almost an organic, more of that urban, you know, you're almost a stranger in the city, yet everyone can influence each other. 
Uh, Durkheim believed that even the most individualistic actions have sociological explanations, and he set out to establish a scientific methodology for studying these actions. He chose for his case study the most individualistic actions such as suicide and used statistical data to show that suicides were related to social factors such as religious affiliation, marital status, and employment. And again, the idea is, do you need to be connected to people? And how much connection do we need? And so what they found was that what they found was that, you know, if you don't have that connection to other people, factors like, you know, being connected to religions or being married or being employed, that tends to increase suicide rates. Again, pushing that argument that we all need people in our lives, we need to have these social bonds. So again, Durkheim says that if you don't have connection to other people, groups of people, then you experience anime, which is a disconnect resulting from having weak social bonds. Again, how does not being connected to other people affect you? Does it have negative impacts on your life? Okay. So when it comes to structural fear, uh, functionalism, Durkheim is one of the first to really take sociology and make it you know, standardize it and do a sense that we can apply the scientific method to go out and study these factors. So Durkheim, you know, went out and used empirical studies to look at suicide rates versus their connection or how often they go to church or things along those lines. Not saying that like, you know, one set religion is like the way to go, but Durkheim was looking at for this one, he was looking at Christians and whether they went to church and whether that was associated with suicide rates, for example. And then he found them that it was. And again, we can use statistical analysis, for example, to look at things like suicide rates versus, you know, social connections and to see how that kind of thing plays out. Uh, the two main principles of functionalism, again, we've talked about how society is conceived as a stable, ordered system made up of interrelated parts or institutions or structures, all of which structure our life, the education system structures your life, the government, the media, the economy, your family, all of these things have big influences on you as a person. Each structure has a function. Again, what's the purpose of the education system? What function does it serve? And again, why do we create it? Generally, the assumption is we created the education system to contribute to the continued stability or equilibrium of the unified whole. Again, if we don't teach the children and socialize them the skills and tricks they need to be able to get along in society, to be able to take social roles, well, we still have that stable society that we once had. And then structures is one of the most confusing words in all of sociology. And I like to think about structures as anything that enables or blocks you, like your parents um, or your grandparents or whoever raises you, they're structures, right? They can enable you by giving you food and helping you and teaching you, but they can also block you from by grounding you if you step out of line, for example. Um, but again, the social institutions that structure society, groups of people, our lives, the family, education system, politics, religion, uh, economics, race, etc. Uh, again, these socially created institutions, the purpose of them being created in the first place was to meet the needs of society by performing different functions. And again, the argument is that these institutions contribute to this idea of the social order or stability, you know, and that, you know, they all serve a function and a purpose, which then leads us into conflict theory because we need to be questioning the social order and asking what's up. Um, to kind of conclude on functionalism, again, a dysfunction is defined as a disturbance to or undesirable consequence of some aspect of the social uh, system. Any disorganization or dysfunction in a structure leads to a change in a new equilibrium. If one structure is transformed, the mother others must also adjust. And I like to think about dysfunction in terms of like racism or sexism, you know, for hundreds of years in America, anyone that was non-white and non-male was blocked access. Over time, this created a disturbance because people started getting upset and they challenged the status quo and they decided that it was unfair, which makes complete sense, <laughs> considering that women and everybody else were cut out from the Constitution and only white males were given any access, generally white males with means of rising up the social class ladder. But this created so much disturbance in society society that re started out with all these revolts and social movements and we have the suffragist movement and civil rights and again at some point society had to change the institution of racism and the institution of sexism whether it be in physical bondage or whether it be through ideological means of keeping people down just became unacceptable at some point in society okay 
So again, what was the purpose of race in the first place? Again, it was to, you know, enable white males to gain all the power and then subjugate everybody else. What was the purpose of sexism in the first place? You know, so enable male power and to remove females from competing in the market with males. Okay. And again, so again, you can ask what the manifest function of race is in the first place or gender roles is in the first place. And we can have many different arguments. But again, our traditional gender roles linked to a reduction in women's you know, rights. They are, you know, and so just, you know, to get you guys thinking about some stuff. But again, manifest functions, when Durkheim's talking about that, what's the overt purpose of the education system? To teach, to credentialize, to filter people out. But what are the latent functions of the education system? Again, maybe it doesn't work too much. Maybe some kids get really bored. They'd rather be outside learning. You know, Not everyone can sit still for hours on end, for example. Those that don't succeed in the education system tend to get stuck in the lower classes of society. All of these are latent functions of the education system, for example. Um, again, advantages and critiques of functionalism. Functionalism is an inclusive of all institutions. It attempts to provide a universal theory of way of explaining society in one comprehensive model, basically that all institutions contribute to the functioning of the whole and that the purpose of the institutions serve a function, which is to structure society to make it predictable and orderly. Um, it tries to bring together a potentially disorderly world and make sense of it. It is preoccupied with stability and that only dysfunction can create social change. Again, there's ways to you know, change society, even if it's not dysfunctional. Maybe we just have a better way of doing it. It is inherently conservative in its biasness and it's a static model rather than dynamic. It focuses on the macro level and has less interest in explaining independent human action. Its explanations of social inequality are us especially unsatisfying, which we'll talk about with conflict theory. And again, poverty and racism are more than just a social function. All right, so conflict theory. We're talking about conflict theory. We have Marx and Engels as the biggest proponent. Generally, I like to think of conflict theory as group versus group. Uh, it sees conflict between groups um, as the basis of society and social change. Again, it's that friction, that competition that drives society. It emphasizes a materialistic view of society, again, the haves versus the have-nots. It takes a critical view of the status quo and a dynamic model of historical change. Again, the idea of challenging the way things are is a completely acceptable way of looking at things. If society is not functioning, if there's too much inequality in society, you know, should we have a shift? And it's sometimes it's not even a question of should, sometimes it's force, like with major revolutions, like the French Revolution or the American Revolution, for example. The Americans were sick of being ruled by the British, so what did they do? They just overthrew the bourgeoisie and they changed the world. Uh, conflict theory is a macro level approach to understanding social life, just like functionalism. We're going from the big down. We're looking at how things like economic forces influence groups of people and individuals that belong to the groups. It emphasizes social inequality as the basic characteristic of society. Again, the inequality that exists between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the upper classes competing with the lower classes for power, individuals and groups trying to consolidate wealth into the hands of the few. Um, the wealthy and power bourgeoisie control major institutions. This is a big element of conflict theory. It comes out of industrialization when you have these monopolistic powers who have all the means of production and can then, uh, and then people that have to sell their labor for money are at the mercy of the bourgeoisie. Um, and so again, if you look at, you know, since like the, you know, colonialism, basically, if you look at Western Europe and a lot of other places across the world, you'll see how power is con consolidated in the hands of the few. Again, the, the idea that the wealthy own a lot of the wealth in America, you know, that holds up today. Um, but this idea that there's a class system, right? So there is, we all live in this class system and depending upon your socioeconomic status, which dictates your location in the class system, that dictates how much power you have. And again, where you are located in the class system that is associated with your overall outcomes. And so the idea is the institutions of society according to conflict theory exist to support those in power. That the police, for example, who do they really work for? You know, who does the military work for? Who does, you know, the economy work for? 
And so again, conflict theory takes a critical stance toward existing social arrangements and attempts to expose their inner workings. Um, conflict theory, again, comes out of industrial change. If you guys go back to the Industrial Revolution, most people left the farms and moved to the cities. And at that point, they could no longer live off the land. Therefore, they had to sell their labor to get capital. And they had to sell their labor to the capital, the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie had the power to set how much money they were willing to pay the people. And a lot of the times, the people just kind of had to accept it. And so if you look at early America in the 18, late 1800s and early 1900s, you know, you have immigrants and a ton of other Americans that basically are working 18 hour jobs with their children in factories and horrible conditions. And at some point, the lower class developed what, you know, Marx calls class consciousness. And they decide to, you know, strike and start a workers rights movement and fight for things like child labor laws and overtime pay and working conditions and working comp and all kinds of these things just to get some power back from the bourgeoisie. But again, even with all of that, if you look at the world today, what do you see? How is it stratified? How is society divided into social classes? Is inequality exists? Are there some people with hundreds of millions of dollars and then some people with nothing? And again, that's what you kind of see. And so where does that come about? This comes about from industrial revolution in which society became highly stratified into social classes and some having a lot and some not having a lot. And again, this is just basic capitalism. The goal of capitalism is to consolidate capital into the hands of the few. Okay. And so Marx believed that most of these problems were a result of capitalism, that this inequality that we see in modern times results from capitalism and building an economy of capitalism, uh, the emerging economic system based on private for-profit operation of industry. And so as a challenge to this, you know, you have the manifesto of the Communist Party that comes out of this, which then gets skewed a lot. And again, we don't really, I don't know if anyone really buys into like the and results of the Communist Party manifesto is not really kind of our thing in America, especially. But, you know, the idea that there is inequality between social classes, that's what the main focus that I always pull out of conflict theory is. And again, where you're located in the class system dictates so much of your outcomes. And we have to ask, is that fair? Is it fair that some inequality exists? And, you know, some inequality is good because it incentivizes people. But again, if you are born in poverty, the likelihood of you getting out of poverty is rare. And if society doesn't invest in all kids equally, like kids in poverty, then really the only ones who get a chance to rise up are the kids that society invests in that are not in poverty. And so again, this makes us want to ask questions about inequality, like, should we have educational inequality? You know, should every kid go to a school that all the schools are funded the same way? Or do we want a society in which those who grow up in the high tax districts, their kids go to better schools and have better outcomes? So in industrial society, the forces of capitalism were creating distinct social and economic classes, which we see today, exasperating the disparities between the wealthy and the poor, which we see today. I mean, is there even a middle class left in America or has it been shrunk completely is a pretty relevant question in modern times. Marx felt that the inequality between social classes would lead to that class struggle between those who own the means of production, the bourgeoisie and those who had to work for them, the proletariat who have to sell their labor. And again, you like right now there's a, you know, United Auto Workers is on strike while I'm filming this, for example. And again, the CEOs are making $29 million a year while the employees are making like 55, 60. And so the question is, is that fair? At what point is it not fair? And again, that's that conflict between those who own the means of production, the CEOs, the stockholders, and the owners of the company versus the laborers, those who work for the company. Okay. So again, capitalism and the Industrial Revolution perpetuated social inequality because it created just so much stratification between social classes. And again, this has always existed, but it's a little bit different in modern times. Because it's not like just like a king or the barons or a couple wealthy landlords that own everything. Now it's, you know, who is the bourgeoisie? It's a little bit different. The ruling classes change. It's no longer a fiefdom, 
right? Where like the kings own all the land. Now it's the capitalists own all the land, okay? Uh, and so social inequality is defined as the unequal distribution of wealth, power, or prestige among members of society. And again, we see that there are good schools and bad schools in America. There are poor towns and rich towns in America. And is that the way it should be? Just questioning things, means of production, anything that can create wealth. So when you say those who have the means of production, the owners of the companies, the corporate owners, those who own the land, they're the ones who own the means of production and the laborers don't have that. So again, the car workers, they don't own the means of production. They have to sell their labor. Whereas those that own the means of production get to negotiate with those selling their labor and then make profits off of their work. The proletariat, again, the lower class, the working class, those who have no means of production, and the bourgeoisie, the owners, the modern capitalists who own the, the means of production and employ the wage laborers. Okay, anime in functionalism means disconnect from society. And then alienation and conflict theory means disconnect from your work. And again, the question is, you know, do we all need to be connected to our work? But in modern times, if we just have to sell our labor, do we all have the ability to be creative? And so there can be a negative effect to like having to work a job just to make money your whole life. And so again, we had to ask these questions. Um, Marx believed that oppression would become unbearable and the proletariat would rise up against the bourgeoisie. This has happened several times, you know, in human history. You have the lower class revolting. You have the American revolutionaries revolting. And again, he envisioned this place of classless society, the socialist or capitalism in which each person contributed to and benefit for the public good. But if you ever read Anne Rand or Atlas Shrugged, great critiques of communism, sometimes we need some inequality to incentivize people. Like what's going to incentivize a doctor if a trash person makes just as much of them without having to go to school and study as much as they do, for example, okay? And so you have to ask the question of, but how much inequality is too much inequality? Like, should it be acceptable for there to be billionaires in the world while there are children starving? And again, the number of children in poverty is increasing while the number of billionaires is also increasing. Again, billionaires make their money off of the labor of the proletariat. And okay, and so at what point is the proletariat going to be like, okay, the billionaires have too much money, should we revolt and redistribute the wealth? And that's kind of the question that conflict theory and Marx is asking, you know, 150 years ago. Can we be freed from these oppressive conditions in which we have to sell our labor in warehouses, doing jobs we hate while the owners of the warehouses are, you know, sending rockets into space and doing whatever they want, okay? But again, so you have to ask the good critiques, like, there's capitalism, there's communism, there's all different kinds of, there's blends of that. Like, you know, you see in Britain, for example, high tax rates, but still it's capitalism, but it's kind of socialism, you know? And so you, you see blends of capitalism and socialism and, you know, which is the direction to go? Like, you know, how much social programs should we have? How many are too many and how many is not enough? Um. I mean, I could literally just go on for days <laughs> about conflict theory. But again, in the end, Marx just said that, you know, in the end, the lower class hopefully will gain some form of class consciousness. And when they gain that class consciousness, they realize that social inequality um, doesn't have to be this way. Then at what point were they try to create a revolution and take back power from the rich? Okay. So again, Marx was heavily big on the ideologies, the system of beliefs, attitudes, and values that direct a society and reproduces the status quo of the bourgeoisie. Again, what is the ideology of our dominant culture? We have a capitalist dominant culture, and because we have, you know, capitalism as a dominant belief in our culture, this then structures society and reproduces the status quo of the bourgeoisie, in which the bourgeoisie continues to consolidate power and you know make profit off the laborers and consolidate power in the hands of the few okay and so marx was really saying that the problem is most people have this false ideology they just kind of deny the truth that they actually have the power you know and that it's really the bourgeoisie and their interests that rule the world and so the question is is it you know I always like to ask that question, is capitalism the only way or is capitalism the best way, you know, and it's just to get people thinking about it and looking at things from all different kinds of directions. Okay. Uh, again, 
conflict theory stance and sharp contracts to functionalism. I mean, that's usually what the book says. But I mean, I think, again, I like the idea that all these theories kind of work together. You know, functionalism is all about, you know, the unified whole and these institutions structuring the whole. But, you know, conflict theory is really just kind of challenging those institutions, if anything else. I don't know if it's in sharp contrast so much like the book would say, but I do think that it kind of challenges the institutions. That's the good way to apply conflict theory, to be able to look at like how inequality from racism and sexism and classism actually exists. OK, conflict theory argues that a social arrangement's existence does not mean that it's beneficial. It merely represents the interests of those in power. So, again, you have to think about it like this is not the only education system that we could have. This education system that we have now filters out people into social classes. Not all kids have a fair shot. And those who don't have a fair shot, they tend to end up in the lower classes selling their labor to make the bourgeoisie rich. Again, this is not the only way. But again, what's the purpose of the education system? You know, conflict theory would say, yeah, it's socialization, you're teaching kids and all that, but really you're filtering them into social classes. That's what it's really doing. Okay. All right, so to wrap up the theory, symbolic interactionism is super interesting. And this is the idea that the social context is socially constructed through interaction using symbols or our language. Again, the social world that we know it doesn't exist in nature. It's us that created it. Again, I like to joke with my classes like squirrels don't get married in the wild, yet humans do. Why? It's because we people got together one day, hung out, came up with this idea called marriage, and then we teach all of our kids or whatever, hey, you're supposed to be married or marriage doesn't matter or whatever you guys teach your kids. But again, this institution of marriage is something that we created, you know, but it's not the only way. It's just something that we created. But that's symbolic interactionism. We're the ones who came up with this education system. We created it. We created capitalism. Capitalism doesn't necessarily exist in the wild. It's something we created. We're the ones who made banks and capital and credit and, you know, all of these things. Going back to the Italian bankers in the Renaissance, you know, in the beginning of those early corporations of, and they go out and do big trade because, again, in order to get a bunch of ships together to go over to like China and get a bunch of silks and then bring them back, you had to have capital. So we created like, you know, like the East India Company was like one of the first to create stock. They got investors to come together, invest in their company. They used that money to buy ships. Then they went and traded some stuff, came back, made profit, paid off their investors you know, and then sold some more shock and stock and got some more money. But again, this is just us creating the social world. So again, when I teach symbolic interactionism, I usually teach it out first as we build society. It is us, groups of people working together to create the social world and the institutions that structure our lives, along with our ideologies and attitudes. And you can even say potentially religions. Is it us who creates religion? You know, there has been thousands upon thousands of religions if you go back throughout human history. And now we've consolidated those into about six. And again, if you applied conflict theory to religion, you know, the consolidating of capital or power into the hands of the few has religion undergone its own consolidation over time is a really good question. But again, that's just society constantly evolving and humans constantly structuring the world. So symbolic interactionism, we build society. By interacting with each other, using symbols, language, we're the ones who build the social world. George Herbert Mead is often credited as the introduction, you know, main proponent for symbolic interactionism. But again, we as people work together to build the social world. So this paradigm sees interaction as meaning is central to society and assumes that meanings are not inherent, but are created through interaction. The origin of symbolic interactionism and George Herbert Mead comes out of the Chicago School, which is centered on urban settings and field research methods, going out and actually doing um, applied sociology, going out and working with the people and trying to make the world better and end poverty, you know, things along those lines. Um, 
Symbolic interactionism is considered a micro level theory. Again, the idea that it's individuals interacting with each other to make up these groups build society. Uh, you have some people that are credited as being big on this, like Dubois and Adams, who led the way for minorities and women to become influential scholars also in the discipline of sociology. And sociology opens the door because if you're a minority, the sociological perspective, and anyone who wants to look at that can see how, you know, the social forces of being a minority absolutely structure your life. Like Dubois, who was, you know, identified as black, he was one, he was the first person identified as black to get a PhD from Harvard. And he looked out at the American dream and said, is it for me? And he said, no, because of the color of my skin, even with my PhD from Harvard. But again, it's us who created this racist world that America can be characterized as and still pretty much is. There's so much racism that continues in America and so much racist ideology that's just lingers from generation to generation. But it's Americans, along with Europeans, that really created this racist society that we live in. They created this idea of race. And then they created a world in which your race dictated your access to socioeconomic status, for example. Um, me proposed that both human development and the meanings we assign to everyday objects and events are fundamentally social processes. They require the interaction of multiple individuals. And what is crucial to the development of self and society is language, the means by which we communicate with one another. For me, there is no mind without language, and language itself is a product of social interaction. And then to conclude, dramaturgy is an approach pioneered by Irving Goffman in which social life is analyzed in terms of its similarities to its theatrical performance. We often think about it like we're all actors on a stage engaging in a social performance. It's further symbolic interactionist concepts of the self in a seemingly radical way, indicating that the self is essentially on loan to us from society. What this actually means is that yourself, who you are as a person, comes about through social interaction, that you have your inner self and that you have your social self. And how often do you ever express your inner self completely in the social world? And none of us can because society structures our behavior, right? We can't just be that person that you know we might want to be all the time because it might not fit along so we all then play the roles that we're supposed to play we you know like actors on a stage okay and so that's the best way to think about uh dramaturgy okay um all right thank you very much <laughs>